in this day and age where we often find ourselves overwhelmed with quantity rather than quality, it's quite refreshing to find ourselves stripping right back. Sometimes all you need is impactful architecture, considered furniture design and modern art. In today's episode of Finest Homes, we're visiting a home that has a rich history. A house designed by Bauhaus architect Douglas Cohen in the 1930s, it is a dramatic example of the modern movement at the time. Enrico de Fanchio was tasked with enlarging the house whilst maintaining its integrity, simplicity and functionality. Wow, Enrico, what an incredibly simple yet sophisticated facade. What sort of architectural design were you working with here? Here we started working with the original home that was quite relevant because it was one of the award-winning homes of the South African modern movement from the 1920s, 1930s. Very simple, very elegant, because that was really the uh, character of that architecture of the early modern movement, using only four materials, uh, white uh, plaster, you know, white painted plaster, black steel, glass and wood. Uh, and we carried on that, so we actually took these four materials, the, the white paint, the timber, the black steel and the glass, and all the additions to the house we just followed through, and, and, and that's why I think, uh, I really believe it, it's seamless, you know. So it's almost like we're looking at an architectural capsule, time capsule, yeah. if you will, yeah. but what sort of scope of work did you have to sort of bring it to today? So we were fortunate because our clients understood the heritage and this, and this specific relevance of this house. So they really wanted us to respect it. And so we, as you said correctly, it's a time capsule. We really only tweaked and, and restored what was there originally in the house. And uh, the additions, um, very minimalist, so that they don't compete with the original architecture. They're actually a little bit more subdued and have exactly the same materials. Um, and, and it was very much about finding the original details and, and restoring them and also using them to, to inspire the details of the, or, you know, of the new additions as well. Yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned yeah. the four ingredients, but it really seems like shape and form yeah. Yeah. plays a massive role as well here. The, this house is the typical um, language of modern movement. It's square, it's got the cube and the cylinder, that was very much the two main elements used by the architects at the time. And I think the main, the main feature that you see as we go through the house is the entrance with the curved glass wall. And I think everything in this design must have started from there. Uh, arriving in this house in the 1930s must have been really an, a jaw-dropping experience because you have a double volume, you have a double volume curved glass wall with a lot of light coming in. And, it, and it's almost the, 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 the only uh, indulgence in this design. Everything else is very um, Spartan, is very minimalist, um, which is very much the thinking of this, of this vein of architecture at the time. So we follow that. Even in the additions, we, are, we use the cylindrical you know, um, shape for the, for the study, the new study, a, a cube for the new addition of the uh, lounge and, and the roof terrace and the main bedroom. So that we really wanted to be consistent with the original language without copying it. So you can still see what is, what is new and what is old, um, but remaining consistent with the original, the original idea, which was about less is more, you know, that was really the, the mantra at the time. It's like, keep it very simple and be disciplined about shapes and about uh, limiting materials, yeah? Mm. It sounds like the staircase was a real sort of star yeah. feature um, and you can sort of see it meandering from outside yes. even. So how much of the exterior influenced the interior and vice versa? So uh, an, another principle of, this, um, the, of the architecture of this time was that form follows function. So instead of having, you know, if you look at historical buildings, uh, Baroque buildings that may have a curved staircase inside, but outside of the building has a different shape. And that is, that very much, you know, uh, recurs in, in many architectures. It was quite a strict rule of 
um, the modern movements that form had to follow function. Therefore, if you got this curved staircase inside, you have to see it from outside. But it almost, I'd say, the, the exterior follows follows the design of the stair internally, if that makes sense. Well, in the true sense of what you've just said, let's follow the interior from the exterior. <laughs> As soon as you step inside, the soaring staircase offers an uplifting contrast. Sculptural in its design, the staircase boasts a strikingly appropriate glass bauble chandelier as its only adornment. The long passage with glimpses into the rest of the house draws you into the cool and calm living areas. The new lounge, surrounded by nature and uplifted with light and music, is the most calming room in the house. It's surrounded by sliding glass doors with timber louvers, which allow maximum sun in winter and minimal sun in summer. Now I realise that retaining the integrity of the original home was very important to you, but talk to us about some of the new pieces you added to the home. So where we're standing is the main uh, new addition to the house because the, uh, the clients wanted to retain the traditional, more formal entertainment area, the dining room and the old lounge, but also have a very open plan, flowing entertainment area, which is where we're standing at the moment. And, um, to be so open and, and glazed all around, we then added um, a shutter louver that uh, one can move during the day. When the sun moves to the other side in summer, this can become a beautifully shaded space, but you're still feeling outside. Uh, it can open and close completely. So this is a very contemporary and very um, open flowing to the garden on all sides, um, but by keeping consistency materials and shapes, also connects harmoniously with the original house. Was this part of the client's brief and what sort of environment were they aiming to create here? They, they were really trying to uh, achieve an environment that was informal but at the same time very elegant and almost like an art gallery. As you can see there are incredible, there's a, there's a phenomenal collection of South African contemporary artists uh, on the walls and in the garden, the sculptures. So it's very much an aesthetic experience but more relaxed than in the traditional parts of the house. And uh, therefore, uh, this, this wing is a completely transparent box and also with a higher ceiling, a higher volume. So it's quite, quite significantly different from the spaces that you experience in the, in the rest of the house. They're a bit smaller and lower and more traditional. Uh, but at the same time, it's mainly the consistency of materials that, that brings everything together, if that makes sense. Well, I love how the modern elements work so well with the traditional sort of existing elements. How did you balance this? So it was really about understanding what was original and finding even details like the steel railing that you see on the first floor that was really just a pipe because this was the first industrial chic architecture that happened in the world. So they used the industrial pipes for railing. So we painted it red to celebrate it. And red was also one of the colors of this, this time for the architecture. They used primary colors. So, so we definitely wanted to maintain the flat roof and then all the additions maintain also the horizontal lines. But we did introduce contemporary and, and quite innovative things. It's in fact the first project where we use this particular detail of horizontal louver uh, that is shaped in a way that in summer it stops the sun from penetrating on the patio but in winter allows the, the angled sun to, to flood the space and warm the space. Uh, and uh, we then from this project onwards, we, we use this type of detail, which we call passive solar design, to cool the buildings in summer and heat them in winter just using the sun. After the break, we speak to a design specialist on the incorporation of iconic furniture pieces with their period-bound home.
In today's episode of Finest Homes, we're visiting a home that boasts elements from the Bauhaus modernist movement, which enjoyed a sensitive update by architect Enrico De Fancchio. Before the break, Enrico explained to us how the new addition aided to elevate the design without detracting from the original essence that is modernist architecture. When it comes to the inside, the owners have kept the furniture selection simple, with a focus on collectible modern art and furniture pieces true to the modern era. I invited over friend and design specialist Ngulin Tleko of Imbewu Design to talk mid-century modern interior design and how the homeowners have managed to execute this brief over time by working with local designers and collecting iconic furniture pieces. Guli, I'm really loving this indoor outdoor living space, but it seems like furniture plays a really important role here. What furniture choices do you make in order to achieve this look? Absolutely. Um, indoor outdoor is very characteristic of mid century modern, which, as we know, was the brief from the client to really emulate that style, that decor style from that time period in the space. I recognize so many iconic pieces around here. Can you talk us through the space from the outside in? So as you know, the client's brief was very much to emulate a mid-century modern look, aesthetic. So if you look towards the outdoor patio, there is beautiful serpentine sofas, which are very useful for indoor and outdoor use, which is very typical of the mid-century modern era. So you have to know that the mid-century modern era happened um, in the late 1930s, well into the 1970s, and it really took root in Southern California and Palm Springs. Of course, the weather was beautiful all year round, so they really wanted furniture that could work for both indoor and outdoor spaces. So the serpentine sofa, a classic from Linga Rose, um, works beautifully outdoors, but can also be used in an indoor space as well. Uh, similar to the classic Togos by Michael Ducroy, um, also very comfortable, beautiful chairs that can be used indoor, outdoor, and they have that classic pop, which is very characteristic of the mid-century modern style. I must say, it sounds like we're in a time capsule that really pays homage to so many different eras. Yes. But something we don't always see today, especially, is a room that looks like the one in front of us, mm. that looks almost stark, but it works in a home. Well, what's really beautiful about uh, this room is that, the, again, they've taken something that underpins the mid-century modern style and they've gone with geometries. So the mid-century modern style was very much birthed out of Bauhaus. Unfortunately, that was cut short because of World War II. So outside of World War II, there was really this optimistic style of design and a lot of geometries and colors and patterns and prints. So what makes this uh, space very beautiful, although it's stark, is this beautiful um, geometric pattern in the artwork that we see on the wall. What are some of the guidelines you'd offer someone who perhaps wants to start from the bottom up? So guidelines for mid-century modern. I would say that um, very clean lines, very gracious, gentle curves. Um, Louis Sull Sullivan, a very famous designer, coined the term form follows function. So there's a very um, practical uh, underpinning to the furniture, but of course they want it to be comfortable as well. So if you find a piece that is extremely comfortable, got sleek lines, gracious curves, that would be a good place to start. Oh, that's awesome. And it sounds yeah. like even with some of the iconic pieces we see here, mm. technology has played a massive role in the look and feel that you get out of them. Absolutely. So as I said, um, mid-century modern came after a post-war era. So there were all kinds of technologies that were available for furniture designers to use that, were, that they had not seen before. So plywood, for instance, was a very big one, being able to bend and mold steel. So even if you see with the serpentine out there, um, the steel structure has been able to be woven and interwoven between the upholstery to create a beautiful shape. Guli, this is such a beautiful dining room, but tell us, how does it fit into the overall aesthetic? These chairs are very much underpinned by the Bauhaus style, but what mid-century modern did is it took the Bauhaus style and it relaxed it a bit. So you see you've got your gentle curves, um, you've got a mixture of materials, so you've mixed the leather with the metals. So that is one way that I would say that it fits in with the mid-century modernist brief. 
Another element that I think really ties in well with the mid-century modern brief that this client had um, is this very iconic artwork by Mikhail Sabotsky. He's um, a South African artist. And of course, this is uh, the interior of the very famous Ponte Towers. So this beautiful, iconic image also brings in that, those geometries that we spoke about um, in the previous room as well. So it brings in the geometries from the Bauhaus and it really adds some texture to the space. I really want to talk about the ceiling. It looks beautiful, but mm. does it have some specific function? I think it does. Absolutely. So as we said with mid-century modern, form follows function. This is the golden rule, if you like, of this aesthetic. So yes, while it is beautiful, it also has acoustic properties, which makes sure that when you're in the room, all the sound is absorbed, there's no echo, and just makes for a wonderful environment. Yeah, this room really holds its own. I mean, the flow is beautiful from room to room, but yes. I love the fact that you can still sort of close it off and make it quite intimate for a dining room. No, that's wonderful. I do feel that there is kind of a style moving towards open plan, but what's really lovely about this space is you can close it off and have the spaces interconnected if they are open. But what's really nice is if you just want an intimate dining room party, you can close it off, have a full view of the outside, but it feels like one cozy room. Nguli, this feels like quintessential mid-century modern. What are some of the standout pieces in this space? So I would have to say in this space, one piece that I feel is very quintessential to mid-century modern design is the console that's seated behind the sofa. This console has a tapered leg. This was very characteristic of uh, the mid-century modern design pieces. A lesser known influence of mid-century modern is actually Scandinavian design. So those very clean lines was actually developing across the pond at the very same time. Um, and as you can see, while mid-century modern was developing and Scandinavian was developing, there was definitely a move away from stuffy design. So all those ornate, over-embellished types of furniture that were often carved out of solid wood, they've moved away from that and they've used new technologies like wood veneer to be able to create sleek, thin lines with different shapes. Um, so I would say that console is very characteristic, not just in its materiality, but also in its form and its function. Enrico mentioned just on the exterior, the relationship between the black and white, and it's so lovely to see how well translated it is in this room. Absolutely. So again, with mid-century modern, there was always this pop of color, not too much color, but a black and white canvas is always beautiful to let that color really stand out. So these etchings behind you uh, were actually done by the architect himself, Enrico de Funcchio. Um, these are beautiful etchings. The one is called Dream, the other one's called Awakening, but they really tie in well with, as you said the exterior the black and white contrast but again you have to have that pop of color just to tie in that mid-century look speaking of color i see that the furniture selection here mm. has kept a very neutral palette so as i said pops of color so you don't want too much color um, it's nice for the layout to act as a canvas for that one pop and um, in this room specifically it's this beautiful artwork but I'd like to speak about the furniture a little bit as well. Um, this beautiful table, a Linga Rosé table, it's called the oxidization table. As I said, those new technologies that were coming in in the early 40s, 50s, where people were able to experiment with materiality. So while this has the simple shape and form inspired by the Bauhaus, the oxidization of the countertops really underpins a play with materiality, which was very, very characteristic of mid-century modern design. The other piece that I have to point to, um, of course you may be familiar with the iconic womb chair, which was a very iconic piece that came from that era. This is very much inspired by the womb chair. Mid-century modern was obsessed with ergonomics, making sure that form follows function and that pieces are comfortable and are suited to the body. And another thing that really stands out for me is the hairpin legs on this coffee table. So this beautiful coffee table, again, American walnut, very typical of the time, juxtaposed with the two oxidization tables. So really pairing geometries, which again was born out of that Bauhaus movement, which heavily influenced uh, the mid-century modern design. Um, but if you just take a closer look, the hairpin legs, um, mid-century modernists were very fascinated with mixing materials and having you know, something that feels very heavy with something that feels very delicate. And these hairpin legs really showcase that beautifully. Stay with us as after the break we visit Heather Boating to break down a mid-century modern mood board.
In today's episode of Finest Homes, we visited a home with architectural roots in the 1930s Bauhaus movement. The house enjoyed a recent update, thanks to architect Enrico De Fonchio, which has made the house relevant to the 21st century. We also spoke to design specialist Ngulin Tleko, who shared her thoughts on the execution of the interior and the beautifully relevant furniture acquired by the homeowners. Now we visit great friend to the show, Heather Boating, who will share her take on a mid-century modernist interior design scheme. Heather, today it felt like we were really dancing on an architectural or design timeline, but the era that really stood out for us was mid-century modern. What does that mean to you? Mid-century modern to me is certainly defined by clean lines. We're going for organic shapes and we're stripping everything down to its functionality. So no extras, plain, simple, functional, beautiful pieces is what mid-century is going to all be about. Absolutely, no fluff is what I got from that. And so furniture seemed like a staple consideration from the very, you know, from the get-go. So if we're talking furniture here, can you talk about some of the fabrics that you've selected for us in this display? So again, going back to the clean lines, I would concentrate more on those pops of colours as well as your plain fabrics with your furniture. We'll then resonate with beautiful organic shapes with wood bent furniture pieces and then pair it with a pop of colour and a bright fabric. And so if we're looking at the different patterns that you've got here, I see sort of simple lines once again. Could you introduce one or two sort of exciting, eclectic patterns? Certainly. I would have some fun with some geometric shapes in your splashback, in your kitchen for instance, or a bathroom would be another lovely application to again just enhance a bit of pop of colour. So unlike traditional homes, it sort of felt like there could be a sense of starkness or lean towards a clinical aesthetic. How do we keep the balance and ensure that it still feels like home? Absolutely. I think what's going to be key with the mid-century design is, again, honouring those beautiful pieces. So I wouldn't be afraid just to have a open room with a beautiful day bed, a sofa and a lovely pop of art on the walls. I must say some of my favourite pieces were the iconic wooden accessories like the console. And I see you've got some wood on this display as well. Can you talk us through some of the other materials you have? I think this is a great start to when we put together a mid-century look and feel and mood board. I think that warmth is going to be translated with that wood on wood. So again, don't be afraid to use different shades and different types of wood. You certainly are going to be building up a collection of art pieces and furniture. So again, don't be afraid of that. We can start with a wooden floor, for instance, in a lovely stain or just a traditional oak. Then we can also apply a beautiful wooden furniture piece on top. I would soften that look up with a lovely plush rug. And then again, to introduce those pops of colour that we were talking about earlier, have fun with upholstering a cushion, a sofa, scatter cushions, and really just combine those looks of your cool greens with that warm red that will be brought through with the furniture. I love the, the primary shades that we go for, but I would certainly introduce a more muted color palette. So it's not necessarily your bright primary, but we're going for more of your mustard yellows and a little bit more of that red rouge, as opposed to the brighter elements that you could add to your space. Well, I have to ask, is this a look that would be appropriate for all room types and all sizes in terms of home? It certainly will be. It's easily translated all the way from small apartments with those iconic furniture pieces, as well as what you described as almost a museum-like larger home. Empty space, but really display and showcase those phenomenal pieces. That's it for this week. Do join us again next week 